Hello and welcome to this uh, lecture 2, Advanced Machining Processes. I am now going to take over a little bit of uh, just overall peripheral discussion into uh, the state of you know micro engineering microsystems research and uh, with just a few slides of where uh, we see this microsystems research going and how you know what kind of uh, modules are available today in the industry. We will uh, try to start with the advanced machining process. The first process of course today would be the mechanical processes where we will talk in great details of USM ultrasonic machining and uh, we will talk it from a physical model perspective and then later on try to see what can be done you know with such a process um, to make some of these so called uh, micro manufactured systems or micro systems. So, when we look at the whole uh, micro nano systems they are typically defined as ones which are made up of small components at least one dimension should be in the micron or the nanometer scale and uh, these uh, systems they have relatively high applicability to the field of life sciences and biotechnology and medicine. Today you can find out biochips uh, for example which are abundantly available for carrying out diagnostics in medical industry. Also you can find out many examples of surgical interventions within patients where you use micro systems because otherwise macro systems may create a lot of pain and other effects within um, human beings. So one of the reasons why the micro nano systems are important or they are you know gaining a lot of popularity is that uh, you can think of the dimensions of the systems uh, kind of scale and rhyme a lot with the biological entities and these entities may have different size domains. For example, if we look at a virus uh, typically it is a few hundred nanometers in size or if you look at a bacteria a bacterial cell it may be a few tens of microns. Um, there can be you know red blood cells or even you know leukocytes which will be of several different tens of microns within the human system. So the idea is that we build up some structures or some features which kind of um, sync well with this uh, biological world. When we talk of a little more downstream uh, you know entities you get DNA or you get proteins again which are a uh, few nanometers. One helical turn of a DNA for example as I already mentioned in some earlier lecture is close to about 3 to 4 nanometers 30 40 Armstrongs. So if you had features and structures with the processes uh, that you can uh, make which can rhyme or sync with these biological entities it is useful because the, the sensitivity levels of their detection increases and perhaps one of the reasons why this small uh, world you know the micro nano world becomes suddenly very important you know for humanity. Focus of such systems are gradually shifting to the microfluidic uh, uh, systems because obviously biological entities and fluid they hold uh, you know sort of similar kind of coexistence. Uh, human body is made out of fluids most of the biological systems that we talk of entities are within the human body or interacting with the human body. So obviously some fluidic uh, part is kind of necessary in such micro systems research. Now when we talk of it let us uh, look at some example problems where micro systems are really helpful in today's uh, even industry. So one of the finest examples of micro systems that comes to my mind is this bulk micro machined accelerometer. This has been developed by silicon microstructures and basically the idea here is that you have a proof mass which kind of changes directions and you know um, there is some kind of a change in the orientation based on where it is the characteristics of the frame where it is mounted. For example, if such an accelerometer is in a car and there is a sudden need of deacceleration uh, in terms of braking, etc., it should be able to create a signal which should uh, actuate a safety mechanism like an airbag coming up. Uh, so, these accelerometers are 
used everywhere you know for many different applications. Now the idea of a micro system here again is that your sensitivity should be very high. The moment there is a start of such a huge deacceleration process which may be brought in by a collision for example, uh, it should be able to immediately generate a level of signal which actuates the airbag or any other safety mechanism that an automotive may have. So that is why going small uh, you know becomes an advantage sometimes. This uh, right here is an example again I keep uh, illustrating about it is a you know a probe for a atomic force microscope. It is a atomically sharp tip made out of silicon as one can see and this tip is basically you know when you scan this tip over a surface it uh, obviously creates it exposes itself to a lot of forces electrical forces uh, sometimes van der Waals forces and that leads to the frequent oscillation of these tips and uh, you could actually look at the way that the tip um, changes uh, you know its, its orientations and try to get an inverse scan of the surface on which this tip is proceeding through. So that is how AFMs typically work and uh, the again the element here is of course of uh, micron size and uh, made sharp you know to a sharpness of almost the atomic level. So the idea is to be able to develop something which does not have a lot of its own inertial impact because of the extremely small mass that it may have and uh, it may generally carry forward even small forces which it faces while scanning over surface. This again is a very interesting example uh, you know from the digital micro mirror device chips these are basically manufactured by Texas Instruments and uh, the idea here is uh, what goes into your projector. There is an image projection which happens uh, from a digital file you have a PowerPoint or any other you know uh, digital digitally stored uh, set of information in a formatted manner and you are wanting to project that up screen uh, and for that you, you need to be able to operate uh, you know a, a set of mirrors which would align, de-align, uh, make uh, you know the spot bright out of reflection or dark and then based on this brightness or the darkness you define the features you know uh, in the projection capacity. For example you can look at such mirrors here which are in the path of this light signal of course there is a set of you know red green blue filter filters and uh, basically the idea is that now if the mirrors twist and turn and each mirror has a three dimensional view represented here you have a flat silicon piece which is pivoted on two pedestals and there are some electrical interconnects which are down here based on it you could actually twist and turn this mirror and make it either out focus or in focus in the beam that goes reflected or past it into this collecting lens which is projected of course onto a screen right here. This is the collecting lens. So this is a very interesting example of what microsystem can do because these mirrors are very light in weight and they can twist and turn and create you know different patterns and that is how you visualize a big image from a digital file which sends you information related to whether the pixel should be bright or the pixel should be dark. So that is how the DMD chip works. Few more examples for you one is uh, again the single chip accelerometer uh, you know from analog devices, uh, single chip microphone uh, right here. Well, this is based on again the principle of if you look at the cross section of how this is being manufactured you have uh, acoustic holes and uh, basically there is a piezo material which is on the top of these holes right here and the idea is that as I speak and you listen uh, basically the tongue within the oral cavity it creates a set of compression and rarefaction which is what sound is. And those waves would travel through a media, a medium which is there between uh, the speaker and the listener. And the listener would have again a vibrating membrane which we otherwise call the, so it's called the eardrum. So the vibrations coming out from this media between the speaker and the listener, it 
it uh, changes the vibration pattern of the uh, drum and the membrane therein, which creates uh, auditory impact on the human brain itself. So, these uh, same principles are uh, kind of mimicked here as you can see there are acoustic holes in this particular you know structure which are perforated and whatever sounds are emanated from the oral cavity are picked up in terms of some vibrational uh, vibratory effect and that kind of gets converted into an electrical signal uh, which can be again amplified through some uh, amplification means you know uh, by increasing the gain etc. And uh, that goes into a speaker which is a much uh, wider more diameter high diameter membrane which again creates the same compression rarefaction impact on the surrounding air which goes into the listeners ears. So, that is how this uh, the principle of microphone uh, uh, is based upon. Now, uh, if I looked at what is the real USP for all this process? It is the thickness of that membrane, you know this membrane right here, which is able to pick up the smallest possible change in pressure of the medium. So, you can only do if you can go small and make you know micro structure, uh, so that you could very accurately pick up a lot of signals. Uh, that is how microphones are based upon the MEMS microphones. Now, there are upteam number of examples of uh, what microsystems do in day to day processes, particularly live processes. This is a neuroprobe developed at University of Michigan, which is used to observe you know the electrical activity of brain tissue. Uh, this right here is again a neuroprobe developed for providing deep electrical stimulation in patients who are suffering from Parkinson's uh, diseases. Again, uh, there is a set of MOSFETs here in this particular figure and there are various uh, nerve cells growing on the top of this MOSFET. This area again is called nanobiology that how do you see how the cells interact with respect to each other when they are closely growing or they are far apart is being uh, carried out through measurements of you know uh, small surface potential changes across this array of MOS transistors. Now, there is a very famous example of a micro needle. Uh, it is carried out based on the motivation from a mosquito needle and uh, the fabrication is done because such a needle which may be around maybe 20 to 40 nano micrometers in diameter and maybe 180 to 200 micrometers tall uh, is made to make sh you know is, is, is developed to make sure that you can painlessly inject some uh, drug or some moiety into the skin. So, the way it goes is that uh, these needles are made on patches and there are you know tens of thousands of such needles which are suddenly increasing the concentration gradient of um, a particular drug molecule very near to the vasculature and then there is diffusion driven process that happens from where the injectable has been provided and how it is subtaken from the vasculature side. Now, the advantage of this micro needle is that you know this needle would not be able to, it, it pinches into the skin, it does not disturb the pain receptors because there is no deformation damage on the pain receptors, you do not feel the pain as such and the needle does its job to painlessly deliver a drug close to the vasculature. I mean if you were to use a normal injection. Uh, of course, you know particularly in babies and all the uh, the pain level and the experience is, is really horrendous. This is another example of uh, microsystems in biology, you know this is a silicon biochip uh, which was developed uh, at a program in Purdue where they looked at various food pathogens and how they grow and uh, it was an impedance assisted chip which would uh, give you some importance you know of uh, uh, there are electrodes and they will monitor how the cell growth process happens in the medium etcetera. So, again the features and the structures which are being made in all these, this is these are set of micro cantilevers again made at IBM Zurich research, which are used for doing DNA sequencing. Okay. So, all this kind of because they rhyme 
well with the sizes of the entities, what they are playing with, uh, they are quite sensitive. And our job here is really not to look at how the sensing is carried out, but uh, to look at how you could make or how you could manufacture uh, the parts in that smallness which could correlate well to the biological world. So, for that let us start beginning you know a little bit of uh, introductory ideas of uh, advanced machining processes. Of course, there is a class of materials which are used to electronic processing. I am going to come into this uh, a little more in a lot of detail later on, maybe perhaps dedicate a few more lectures, but today I am of course going to start with the, the mechanical processes. So, therefore, I will get into the deep details of the USM process and um, try to pick from there. So, the materials that are typically used in the microsystems or the nanosystems, they started off with silicon and some other microelectronic materials. But there are other materials which were needed along the way, particularly the biological chips, biochips as we call them. They need transparent covers or uh, you know uh, something through which light can pass because a lot of transduction that is carried out uh, in terms of you know change of signal which is machine readable is actually optical. So, therefore, transparency is a major concern sometimes and so therefore, glass and quads um, are very often used as covers. You have polymers of various classes, polydimethyl siloxane being one, polymethyl methacrylate being one and these microsystems can be made with very small micro casting and molding processes as I will illustrate in a little more detail later on. But uh, the idea is that polymers as a class of materials have really emerged well. Uh, the, the processes which are involved in shaping these polymers are called soft lithography processes and uh, they are actually today quite a bit in the industry uh, from uh, the standpoint of catering to the small diagnostic needs. There is Teflon for example, which is a very hydrophobic kind of polymer. You also have materials you know which are biological themselves and you can still carry out micro nano structuring through these biological materials. So, having said that let us now go to the first part of my in lecture series which is about mechanical machining. And here uh, the idea that uh, is kind of proposed is that you have not a direct scratch machining per se, but a throw machining process where there is a small um, hard grain which creates an impact onto a surface. It breaks the surface, it fractures the surface and there is a small embrittlement created on the surface and that embrittlement goes away uh, through the medium which brings in uh, the small uh, grain close to the surface. So, there are various types of uh, mechanical advanced machining systems available today, but uh, when it started off, it really uh, started off with two very broad class of machining processes. One was ultrasonic machining process, we also call it as USM and another is water jet machining process which is otherwise called WJM. Now, there are various uh, variants of these processes. For example, you may have a abrasive water jet or a ice water jet process. Uh, the idea is same that you are using uh, some hard material thrown at a surface to create embrittlement and then carrying out or carrying away the embrittlement to make sure that there is machining action going on on a surface. So, as I think illust I illustrated the machining medium is solid grains, they are suspended in an abrasive slurry. In the USM process for example, the work zone is flooded with that slurry and then there is a ram head which vibrates and impinges. So, that there is a embedment you know of this grains on the surface which it is machining on. So, the machining medium of course, uh, is uh, a critical aspect in mechanical machining because the way you populate uh, the medium, the density at which you are loading is of consequence as I will show later in uh, a model that I will try to build. Um, of course, uh, you know the uh, 
the nature of the grain, the hardness of the grain, the hardness of the surface, the relative strengths of the grain and the surface, they are all critical. And also the frequency at which impact is made is also very critical for uh, the ascertaining of how much material is being removed. Now, the introduction of abrasives to the fluid jet enhances the machining efficiency and uh, you know the water jet machining has a variant called abrasive water jet machining based on it. So, you have not only water uh, creating a pressure zone on a surface, but also uh, a thrown or impinged abrasive which is carried out with the water and creating pressure on a surface. So, having said that, now let us look at you know the first uh, process that I was talking of the ultrasonic machining in a slightly more detailed manner. Uh, the use of USM uh, was proposed by J. O. Farrer that was back in the year 1945 and uh, why it is called ultrasonic is that you do involve uh, a surface which does the impingement uh, to move at a frequency which is in the ultrasonic range. So, the first uh, machine tool using the ultrasonic principle was designed way back in 1954 and basically the process was developed because one needed to finish you know the components which were produced by an earlier uh, developed uh, process called uh, you know the EDM or electro discharge or electro spark machining process. So, uh, USM when it was developed was really a finishing process uh, and uh, people did not think that it will get into the mainstream for uh, making uh, you know uh, making it to be a primary machining operation. Uh, it, it eventually happened today there are MEMS structures uh, like pressure sensors etcetera which are being produced solely based on USM process also in the industry. So, the use became less important because it was a post processing, but now it has become prominent because of that reason and of course, the processes which are mechanical uh, or mechanically assisted in this uh, advanced machining domain works very well for materials which are brittle like for example, you can have silicon or glass as materials you know they are brittle materials they they will have sometime they are electrically non conducting also where other processes like EDM etcetera may fail to work and so therefore, there is a very very skewed window of materials which uh, is considered as far as the USM process goes. So, what is the process let us see. So, in this particular process the basic USM process you have the involvement of a tool as you can see here the tool it is made of a ductile and a tough material this tool and it vibrates with a very high frequency uh, you know you know ultrasonic frequency 20,000 hertz or uh, you know more. And uh, there is a continuous uh, flow of a slurry as I told the slurry contains perhaps some parts of abrasive grains which are dissolved in water or which are solvated in I mean in, in water. So, basically the grains are all suspended inside the water and uh, the water grain slurry goes and affects the machining zone the machining region there is some sort of a you, you can say a operational head being created here on which there is a feed force which is initiated through the tool and this feed force again is initiated uh, in a sinusoidal manner. So, you have the force between some 0 uh, value to uh, uh, some maximum value to again 0 value depending on how the tool is positioned and how it squeezes uh, grains which are close to the surface. So, the frequency of the tool in this particular case which gives the force cycle is about 20,000 hertz and uh, the motion of uh, the tool is uh, for very small amplitudes typically 15 to 20 microns. The abrasive grains are about anywhere between 25 to 50 microns and uh, there can be grains made out of silicon carbide. So, boron carbide uh, which is B 4 C uh, so on so forth. Now, there is a continuous flow of this slurry which is initiated in this small gap between the tool and the work piece where the force field comes and force force um, the forcing ram comes and uh, 
of course, as one squeezes, you know, there are two different cases which happens one when the grain strikes the moving ram and impinges onto the surface through a bouncing action. Uh, the other case is where the, the ram is very close and started squeezing a particle which comes in between the surface and the ram. So, these are two different kinds or approaches of machining uh, that happens, right. But the whole idea is that the impact of the hard abrasive grain fractures the work surface which is otherwise quite hard or brittle and uh, the embrittlement which comes out is kind of removed through sort of a medium which flows along with the abrasive grain. This results in the removal of the work material in form of smaller wear particles etcetera. And of course, the tool material is tough uh, and also ductile and uh, the idea is that you choose the tool material in a manner uh, with an appropriate hardness ratio. So, that the wear on the tool side is relatively lesser in compared comparison to the wear on the the work piece side. So, that is how the whole USM business or the USM process happens. Now, I am going to get into a little more of the model, or the physical model associated with USM to be able to give you some perspective of what is the rate at which the material is being removed, you know, in such a process. Now, if I looked at the mechanics of uh, how the material would be removed as I already kind of illustrated, there are three or four different reasons for such material removal to happen. One is of course, the hammering impact of the abrasive particle on the work surface by the tool. So, this is the squeeze case. Uh, so, you can say that the tool has actively hammered on a abrasive grain pushing it into the work piece surface. Uh, you have the impact of a free abrasive particle on the work surface. That is like you can say the grain throw craze where the grain goes all the way to the vibrating ram, the ram is still not um, in, a, in a position to squeeze because it is slightly farther away and the grains are smaller in uh, you know diameter uh, in comparison to the gap that is there between the, uh, the, the work piece and the ram. And in such a case, if when you are throwing the slurry to a surface, there are going to be impacts uh, which will create rebounds and abrasive grains can be rebounded of the surface and go and strike the, the other surface that is the approaching ram surface. And of course, there is a momentum transfer because of which this can come and create an embedment or an impact onto the work piece surface. So, that is impact from free abrasive grains. You could have erosion due to cavitation. Now, this is something I would like to explain to you in little more detail. You see, when there is a moving membrane or in this case a moving surface, which is doing so at an extremely rapid pace. Uh, you, if you are talking of ultrasonic frequency, it is about 20,000 times in a second. Yeah? So, um, when such a thing happens, uh, of course, the slurry which is there on the other face of the ram, that is the face between the ram and the workpiece, um, that slurry uh, being water would have its own inertial delays. And supposing the, the withdrawal of the surface is sudden, uh, the slurry may not be able to really follow uh, that high a frequency of withdrawal. Of course, it is going to create a low pressure region and uh, you know uh, the low pressure region can be infused through air or uh, some other moieties which are there, some air can be outbleeded by the slurry, slurry. and uh, this gap which is there uh, is able to get covered in some time delay, right. So, therefore, the air inclusions start happening on the medium because of such a process, a very fast moving process and that creates bubbles, yeah, and these bubbles are responsible for a lot of material transport because these bubbles are pressure balls you can say within it is a two phase flow now that you have uh, water from the slurry and the air inclusion which is there from the, the, uh, the atmosphere and uh, these would like to create uh, some impact on the surface and create some erosion on the surface. 
So, this process of formulation of bubbles and what it does to the surface is also called cavitation. And uh, there is a lot of erosion because of cavitation which happens because of this delay of the medium uh, to follow the rapid membrane or the rapid ram head and this in, as in this case uh, so quickly. So, there is also another impact uh, which comes from chemical action. Sometimes the slurry itself is designed in a manner that you may have some chemical erosion component also happening. So, that chemical action associated with the fluid is also responsible sometime for material removal. So, the four principal reasons for the, the USM to sort of shelf the uh, material uh, are illustrated here as the individual hammering action, the impact of free grains, the erosion due to cavitation and the chemical action associated with the fluid used. Now, a number of research have, researchers have already tried to model uh, the USM process, but uh, what we better know, uh, you know in terms of its ability to map the process correctly is one which is proposed by M. C. Shaw. Uh, the model is called Shaw's model and it has some basic presumptions. This is a very basic model which I am getting into to explain how you could relate properties of the surface, properties of the tools like hardnesses etcetera and the grain in order to create uh, an expression for material removal rate. So, let us look at the Shaw model. Now, in this model the direct impact of the tool on the grains in contact with the work piece is taken into consideration. Now, one can say that the rate of work material removal uh, which would happen because of such impact embrittlement and carrying away is proportional to the volume of the work material per impact that is removed. You know, so let us say there are n grains on a surface and each of them have embedded into a harder work piece surface and some volume uh, you know is created because of such embedment. So, wherever the grains have embedded and the embrittlement has happened and the surface has broken those uh, that volume is typically equal to the pinch volume right of the surface. So, we assume that to happen and then we say that the rate of work material removal is really proportional to the volume of the work in one impact. So, you have to consider a ram coming and approaching another surface and impacting the surface and there are several grains which are creating pinch points and several volume removed, several volume fragments removed. So, that is very important to map that how many are in a way getting squeezed together on a particular you know finite area ram surface. It is important to also record the number of particles making impact per cycle. Yeah, so, the volume of the work material removed per impact, number of particles making impact per cycle and also at what rate the ram is approaching. So, what is the frequency at which the ram is approaching? So, the number of times that it approaches in a second is very critical for because we are talking of rates, rates are in time and so time aspect has to be there. And there are certain things which we assume from the M. C. Saws model, one of them is that we assume all the impacts to be identical. And uh, we also assume that all the abrasive grains are identical and spherical in their shape. So, that is how we approach the problem. And let us now start doing the basic model to see what uh, or how do we estimate the overall removal rate, material removal rate. So, the material removal rate Q here is related to V z nu. These are the parameters discussed in the last slide, volume of the work material removed per impact, number of particles making impact per cycle and the frequency. Each of them is of course, having a proportional relationship to material removal. The more would be the volume of work material removed per impact, the more would be the removal rate, the more would be the number of particles making impact per cycle, the more would be the removal rate, the more would be the operating frequency, the more would be the removal rate. So, now let us uh, look at uh, a impinging grain and how we can correlate the material parameters <coughs> of the grain as well as the work surface to that impinging grain model. So, let us assume that there is a surface here, there is a work surface here and there is a grain which comes and pinches on this work surface. Of course, the diameter of the abrasive grain is a small d and uh, one can assume that 
it has created a crater on the surface which is capital D, uh, which is actually a circular crater as can be visible from this example right here. This is a circle of uh, diameter capital, capital D. And uh, in this kind of a case, we need to correlate how this pinching process etcetera is happening and is there any geometric relationship you know between this. Now, we also assume that as the abrasive grain has impinged into the surface, it has traversed about h depth within the surface and that is how the diameter d has come into existence. So, when the grain was touching on the top right here, d was 0 and as the grain is going from depth 0 to depth h, the diameter of the cross section of the grain which is mapping on the surface or getting formulated on the surface is increasing from 0 to capital D. So, the figure on the right is showing the indentation process. caused by the impact of an abrasive grain if capital D is the diameter of the indentation at an instance when the impingement depth is h, we can calculate a geometric relation which corresponds to square of capital D by 2 equaling square of small d by 2 minus d by 2 minus h that means this much square. Now, of course, I mean this results in a relationship d square equals 4 small d h minus 4 h square and as the h is quite less in comparison to the diameter of the grain, one can easily approximate d as twice root of d h neglect h square or 4 h square. So, having said that now, we assume that the volume of material dislodged per impact is proportional to the cube of diameter. So, we get q is proportional to d h to the power of 3 by 2 z times of nu, where the z and the nu have their obvious own obvious meanings. Since the mean speed of the tool is low, the mean static force is 
let us call this force F. applied to the tool can be equated to the mean force experienced by the grains. one can assume that you know we are only going a few microns even if it is 20,000 times in a second. So, the overall velocity of the tool the average velocity is quite low and uh, one can assume that in such a condition one may just hover around the same region with very small movement creating almost a constancy of presence. So, one can assume the force translated between the ram head and the grain to be over large duration yeah. and uh, that uh, can uh, probably mean that your inertial component associated to the impulse created because of tool motion because of the absolutely small amplitude can safely be neglected. And it does not have any impulse anymore, so that the force does not go to the uh, you know twice its value, but you can assume the force at which the tool is being vibrated is typically the force which is being translated onto the grain. So, we have to make this assumption as a part of the Shaw theory of course, there is a problem that you know one can have um, an impulse of the force and sometime there may be grain crushing or grain breaking also in the process. So, we will discuss those details later on once the simplistic model is emerged in a proper manner. So, when the duration of an impact is let us say delta t and the maximum value of the force is f i force f i is f i maximum. And the nature of variation of this force with time is a little tricky, because you have to understand that the ram is moving, it is uh, freeing the grains for a substantial portion of the cycle, and it is only pressing for only a small portion of that cycle. It is a simple harmonic motion, so obviously, there is one section of the motion which is kind of interfering in nature while, uh, while executing the push on the on the, the abrasive, the remaining part is kind of idle, because the tool is going away from the abrasive. So, this kind of a situation has to be mapped in terms of um, you know the force time characteristics and you have to understand that why the force time characteristics is in that particular desired manner. So, it is kind of shown here. So, this is how the force time characteristics is for the grain uh, pressing craze. as one can see and let us understand from a cyclic point of view that assuming this whole time duration starting from here to here as the cycle time or time for one cycle, only a very small portion of that cycle is experienced in terms of a force on the grain. So, the portion for which the tool head presses and unpresses the grain is kind of illustrated here through this delta t. That is how we assume that for a period of delta t there will be contact between the vibrating ram and the grain surface. While the grain is being impinged, the grain is pushed up to a certain depth. Let us say if that maximum depth is h. So, the if I look at the force characteristics, the maximum force which has been translated onto the grain from the ram, ram which is this f i maximum is corresponding to that point 
beyond which the vibrating ram does not press anymore and starts reverting its motion back. So, that there is slower release of the force eventually and there is loss of contact which results in force 0. So, that is how this whole cycle can be explained with a maximum F i max uh, corresponding to the pushing of the grain. Of course, the remaining portions on this whole time period of the vibrating ram is no contact of the ram. So, you have 0 force on the ram which kind of illustrates very well the overall force time characteristics. Now, the average force if I were to look at which is of importance can be provided through the integral you know 0 to t f i t d t and one can you know have the average by looking at the time integral of force divided by the total time period t. Now, of course, t is the time period of each cycle. The duration of an impact Among this t time period is delta t as one has recorded here in this particular illustration. Of course, the maximum force is recorded as f i max. So, uh, owing to the sharpness of this curve and the fact that although there is some uh, curvature to it, one can uh, it may not be too erroneous if uh, one can estimate this whole area under the curve as a triangular area which has a height of f i max and a total width or a total base size of delta t. So, let us try to calculate this on that average basis. So, let us write that it will not be uh, erroneous to assume the nature of variation of force to be triangular therefore f average can be approximated as 1 by t times the area under the triangle which is half base altitude so half times of f i max times of delta t. In other words, this is f i max by 2 times of delta t by t. So, let us call this one. This is the average force of the ram on the abrasive particle. Let us uh, get an idea of what positioning are we referring to. So, you have a tool which is uh, coming from the point 0 where it was centered earlier and it comes all the way to half you know uh, its motion touches the abrasive grain somewhere around A pushes the grain from A to B at a height you know delta H or a depth delta H for the time required delta T and uh, the total time that is needed for the whole cycle being t meaning thereby that you know the simple harmonic part of the tool executes 0 to b plus b to o plus o to c plus c to o in time t therefore one can average out the time of motion for just 
you know the path O B as T by 4 and uh, really the position A and B defines what is the height. So, let us say position B minus position A is the total depth of indentation in this particular case and I think you kind of get a feel of what is going on and for what instance the force is applying to the surface of the grain A. Now, having said that the important aspect here is to be able to calculate this relationship of the various depths which are there which are related in fact inversely to the hardnesses of the materials to this whole process the velocity, the frequency, the amplitude and some of the other parameters. So, if I assume that in a particular impinging operation there is a depth h w moved by the grain towards the workpiece side and a depth h t moved by the grain towards the tool side, then the total indentation span is represented through h t and h w. Of course, this corresponds to work side indentation and this corresponds to tool side indentation. So, if we assumed the amplitude of oscillation as A, the average velocity would be recorded as A divided by T by 4. Remember, we had illustrated about how moving one amplitude motion you know OB corresponds to T by 4 time period. So, that is what the average velocity of the tool is 4 A by T. The total time needed to move the whole indentation depth or indentation span as I would say. let us assume that to be delta t. This is really equal to the total h that has been moved which is h t and h w combination divided by the average velocity which from the last instance was found out as 4 a over t. This is average velocity of the tool. Thus, the average force on the tool comes out to be half F i max times of <coughs> h t plus h w by a times of t by 4 times of 1 by t or in other words one can have the f i max to be equal to 8 times f average times the amplitude a divided by h t plus h w. Now, this kind of indicates the relationship between the average force, the amplitude, the indentation depths. In a way indentation depths are a function of the hardness. So, if the surface is harder, the depth would be lower or vice versa. So, there is an inverse relationship which is available and the purpose of all this analysis is to sort of create a, a sort of a relationship with the material properties on one hand and the uh, 
parametric properties like velocity or frequency, so that one can estimate uh, a generic relationship or way to find out the actual material removal rate. So, I think I would like to close uh, this topic today. I will uh, perhaps you know continue from here in the next lecture. Uh, in the next lecture, we will see even the grain throw case and then try to evaluate whether this case of squeeze you know is better or grain throw is better. We will of course, from these parametric relationships emerge a MRR model and then we will uh, try to use that to estimate machining time etcetera for USM cases. So, as of now, thank you very much for attending this lecture.